Welcome, everybody, to the final episode of the year here on the most potent political talk show uh, on in the world today, I would say. Uh, many people would think of the likes of who's a who's who's a big political speaker, Ela. Bill Maher. Bill Maher. Well, yeah, he's on HBO though. Uh, but we're bigger than whoever you popped into your head certainly <laughs> by a big shot, and to prove that to you, we have with us back again the great Andrew Yang with another incredible showing in the sixth presidential debate. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have with us. The great, fantastic, Yang Gang, Yang Gang, Yang Gang, Yang Gang, yeah. And rolling in on the Gatsby, oh my, my God. God! Here comes the next president of the United States. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> Andrew, thank you for joining us. God bless. Wearing our official Andrew Yang merch. Yes, yes. Which Ian Ian was at the rally uh, yesterday with the uh, childish Gambino and yourself. Yeah, that. And was he was tremendous. in line for hours to get us this merch. The greatest well, merch. I, I'm uh, I'm grateful to him. Grateful to Donald Glover for making the merch uh, and for helping us launch it in L.A. He's such a great guy. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've had a chance to sit down with him. No, no I haven't. haven't. But uh, he's got street cred. And um, real recognize real, as they say. So that was cool to see. I think you all would get along famously. He's very, very human. You know, oh, is he? He, yeah, you spend time with him. He's uh, really very elevated in his thinking. Hmm. Well, I'd love to have the opportunity, but um, uh, since I've got you here, let's talk about. Uh, well, you just came off the uh, the the debate. Yeah. yeah, and I have to say that it was a fantastic debate, definitely the the most interesting. And I think you know I've been watching a lot of coverage, and your name is finally starting to come up a bit. Are you noticing that as well? Yeah, the team's thrilled about it. I, I've been named one of the winners from the debate in a lot of mainstream columns. It's funny having you trying to figure out who's like the apex of political talk shows. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you have an answer to that? You know, some of the names that would have jumped out to me would have been uh, George Stephanopoulos, mm. uh, Jake Tapper, mm. uh, people like that. Our competitors. Your competitors. Yeah. Well, for the, so I mean, I, I, I'm just grateful to you for having me on because I, I know, uh, you know, politics isn't <laughs> necessarily uh, the focus because people have other more fun, better things to talk about. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to get into but for a lot of people. It's oversaturated. That's why I feel like you are such a great candidate because you make it interesting and not just um so political it's actually interesting for anyone i feel like oh thank you that's certainly a goal and i'm not a politician i actually have something of a low interest in politics <laughs> <laughs> although you did uh study poli size that right yeah so i mean i can talk about my my development uh so i was a debater in high school mm -hmm. i went to the World Public Speaking and Debating Championships of 1992 mm. in mm. in London, where I got destroyed by anyone with a British <laughs> accent, which was everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Why does everyone sound so much smarter than me?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I studied political science and economics in college, and then I went to law school. Uh, spent five very unhappy months as a lawyer, mm. uh, but there there came a point when I followed politics, and I actually had a list of goals, and one of my goals was to like elevate. Uh, politician but i didn't want to be one mm. uh and i, I th thought i saw what happened and i thought like wow what a uh what a drag most of these political jobs are especially now in this climate uh, so my running for president i joke that my wife evelyn would have run the other direction if she'd known mm -hmm. what was <laughs> <laughs> right so now she's uh on the campaign trail and uh, <laughs> enjoying the warmth and love of the support we get yeah, the Yang Gang is strong and vocal, <laughs> and it's been great to... You're, I mean, the last time we, we had you on was, uh, gee, how long ago was that? Six, seven months ago or something? I mean, um, back then you were coming up, but I feel like now uh, it's been a steady increase. And even looking back at the recent debate, you still talked the least amount. Yet, 
you stood out, in my opinion, the most. Is your strategy, uh, when I watch you debate, I feel like in a, uh, you, you don't waste words. Is that part of your strategy up there? You speak very directly, very purposefully, and you, you're very succinct. I find oftentimes you're done talking before your allotted time is up, and people are like, kind of making a statement in that, in that way. Is that right? It, it's been a combination of things. Certainly, we've gotten an incredible reception from debates that I have not spoken that much. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Where right. even last night, uh, the team was telling me, I'm, I'm not sure what the number is, but I, I think we've raised uh, over half a million since mm-hmm. last night's debate uh, immediately. Mm. And it has no real, I think we're, it's going to come out that I, I've raised uh, as much or more than any other candidate after last night. Really? And, wow. and I didn't talk yeah. as much as many of them. Half. Yeah. Yeah. And and so one, my natural inclination is to answer a question that's asked of me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you, you do actually answer the question. I think it's obnoxious <laughs> if you don't answer the it's, question. It, yeah. <laughs> so, it's one of the reasons why the debates are such a <laughs> intol- intolerable. I mean, it's, it's always the same. It's like... The, this canned answers, and then you ask them a real question, and they end up veering off and back into their talking point. Yeah. You know, I did not realize how bad it was until I was in this mix, uh, and <laughs> even this context where I, I enjoy sitting with uh, people like you having conversations. Apparently, a lot of politicians avoid these sorts of contexts, yes. like the plague, which makes no sense to me at all. <laughs> you know, it's like if you're well, it's fear, I suppose, of uh, gaffes. I mean, that's the only right. explanation. You know, Hillary Clinton was on Howard Stern recently, and it was just, it was such a breath of fresh air to hear her speaking so candidly and casually with him. I truly think that uh, if she would have done that during the election, she probably would have won. Probably. Because, you know, I, I, I saw people who were uh, Trump supporters saying saying that. Mm-hmm. There was a story that came out that during the Hillary Clinton campaign, there were something like eight people that had to approve any tweet. Oh, my goodness. As an example, they had like a tweet committee. (laughs) (laughs) That's incredible. Trump doesn't have that. He definitely doesn't guarantee that. Like uh, his committee is like eight brain cells getting together. (laughs) being Like, is this a good idea? (laughs) Sure, it's 3 a.m. It's a good idea. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, So Hillary now... um, probably feels like she has nothing to lose and, right. and sure. can become more casual. Yeah. Which is a shame because it's self-defeating, you know? What? Um, well, I can dig into this a little more because I think it's really important. What happened with Hillary Clinton's campaign is that they knew they were going to raise a billion dollars. They had all of this staff at every level. So you can have eight people to approve the tweet, mm-hmm. like the, the tweet right. committee. And so you have all of these layers of people around you that are then like, okay, Hillary, talk about this, 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 and nothing else, and don't talk about any of this list of things. Tell you what, the list of things you can't talk about is so long. <laughs> mm. It's it's easier for you just to say these five or six things. And she's surrounded by dozens, hundreds of people who are sending her this message, <clears throat> and then she does an interview, and then she seems like an automaton. You're right. Yeah. Like that. That's what happens in these campaigns. It's one reason why I've seemed different. Is that in the beginning, our team was, you know, three, four people. We were starting out in my mom's apartment, <laughs> and so there's no committee being like, Yang, you definitely shouldn't say this. <laughs> um, and then now, as we've risen, even though our team is bigger, the same dynamic holds. Um, but I understand why Hillary's incentives pushed her in a particular direction. I think they just thought it was so safe, so assured. They had only to, to mm-hmm. lose from uh, any potential risks, uh, small as it may be, you know. Yeah, and, and that's the, the way you liken it. It's like if you're a really big corporation with a franchise, you know, a franchise that's worth a billion dollars, then you have this massive set of incentives to like circle the wagons and protect Mm -hmm. it. And in Hillary's case, they were like, of course we're going to win or we're going to lose to Trump. Yeah. Uh, And, and they were literally already picking the, picking out the chairs in DC being like, Hey, uh, you're going to (laughs) be ambassador to Switzerland and Mm -hmm. you're going to (laughs) be like, they they literally had it all mapped out. Yeah. I mean, she said on Howard Stern that she didn't even have a, uh, a, a, a losing speech prepared. 
you know, there was only one outcome for them. But there you have it. I think the landscape is changing, and I really think when I look at that debate stage, everybody's just towing the line, and, I mean, it's like I found myself fast-forwarding some of the other people because it's like, dude, you already said that five times in this single debate. But let me ask you, what is it like for you to stand on that stage with some of the most prominent political figures of all time? I mean, of our generation, certainly. And to and to be sharing a stage with them because uh, did you expect already to be uh, have gotten as far as you have been? This is definitely one of the <clears throat> higher end scenarios I had mapped out. <laughs> right. I, I I had some low end scenarios <laughs> projected where you start as like a lone man on a mission and you end as a lone man on a mission. Right. <laughs> and you're just yeah. like there driving the van around New Hampshire, being Mm -hmm. like, hey, guys. Uh, And I could have lived with that because, you know, you you do what you think is right. Um, You fight for what you believe in, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Like, I could have lived with that. But seeing the Yang Yang grow uh, all of the uh, past number of days and weeks and then being on this debate stage, one of the the fun things about running for president is you wind up getting to know the other candidates Mm -hmm. in personal ways because you're in the green room with them Mm -hmm. or you're in the union hall with them or you're at the fish fry with them like Mm -hmm. whatever it is uh you're just interacting with them uh as candidates and people so you get used to it pretty quickly like now i have uh, i mean i'll I'll tell you some fun stories um so i'd been around bernie maybe half a dozen times and then uh I wasn't sure if he liked me because you can't really tell with Bernie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then he said to a journalist, I like Andrew. And I was so touched. I That's was like, oh. yeah, I like I, heard, I heard, saw in an interview. I was like, Bernie likes me. It's so exciting. That's pretty badass. And and then the next time I saw him at the next debate in Atlanta, I was like, hey, Bernie, thank you for saying something uh, nice about me, that journalist. And then Bernie put his arm around me and was like, of course I like you, Andrew. Uh. Bring a lot of good ideas to the table. <laughs> and I, I have to say, my heart sang. I was like, oh, uh. like, I feel like my... my my uncle just uh, <laughs> told yeah. me he was, uh, you know, um, <laughs> excited about me. So uh, that dynamic, um, Joe and I uh, actually bond very naturally on a lot of things. He's the most mm, natively concerned about the impact of technology on the economy hmm. um, of the folks at least I've interacted with directly on this topic. Um, so I, I will say, uh, you know, like I've now become increasingly friendly with more and more of the candidates, but there is a generational gap between mm-hmm. me and, and them. So, like I said last night, I miss Kamala, I miss Corey, mm. uh, like I, I, I miss uh, Beto and Tulsi. Like these are people that I frankly feel more of like a natural connection to because they're around my age mm-hmm. and the yeah. same generation. Was there something that you wish they asked you on the debate stage but didn't? To me, the and we talked about this last time I was here, uh, and I touched on it just a smidgen. It was about trying to align the measurements of our economy with our people. Mm-hmm. And that right now, so many of the answers to the questions last night hinged on our current notion of GDP and jobs and profitability, where one of them said, hey, can we move towards renewable energy if it's going to cost fossil fuel jobs in the short term and you look at that and say and it, it and I considered trying to interject but I was like it's going to be a complicated idea to to get into the debate context that if you were to incorporate the cost of climate change into our economy it would be trillions of dollars mm-hmm. tens or hundreds of thousands of american lives over time and so you'd look up and say the most expensive thing we can do is nothing or continue down this path. Uh, And so if you were to integrate our economic measurements with sustainability Mm. and it's related, uh, our wellness and life expectancy, climate change is influencing our health in various ways, in very negative ways. So uh, we have to try and actually measure the 21st century economy by our own well-being Mm. and if we did that then you would see that fighting climate change is actually uh cheaper Mm. i do love how you um connect everything it's a very um holistic i guess approach with how you combine everything with the well-being of people and i think i i wish that more people talked about that yeah the the thank you hila Uh, (laughs) me too and 
If you reflect on it for a moment, you think, what should the purpose of our economy be if it's not our well-being? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, and right now, GDP uh, is going to get higher and higher as technology does more and more, and more and more of us are going to be left behind and depressed and anxious. Yeah. And so if you don't get those measurements right, then you wind up in this tug of war that I think many of us are already feeling. Mm-hmm. I, I I so appreciate it, and that's so true. Like one of the questions they posed was, you know, the GDP and the economy is doing better than ever. And it, but the, the, the real uh, point, you know, was, well, why doesn't it feel well, like what it? does that mean for real people? Yeah. Just because the stock, the S&P 500 gained uh, 50 points yesterday, that doesn't affect 90 percent of the people living in America. You know, it doesn't. And, and that's the disconnect mm-hmm. where the top. Uh, well, the. The 80 percent of the stock market wealth is held by the top 8 percent of Americans, to, to, to your point. Right. So and at the bottom 50 percent of Americans own essentially zero. Yeah. So you're beating people over the head saying stock markets are it's, stock yeah. markets are up. And then people are being like, what I'm, is the stock market even? <laughs> right. You know, like for most people, it's like, what, what? especially if you're young, because <laughs> if you're young, I just saw this table that came out that said, uh, that the share of wealth for young people is much, much lower than it's been for Gen Xers or certainly boomers. Uh, and so if you're a young person with this pile of student loan debt and this tenuous job that doesn't have any benefits and you're barely treading water, like what does the S&P 500 mean to you? <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and you know, I think it can only contribute to all these, the depression, anxiety, because all the time you're hearing, on the radio, on on the TV, the GDP is great, the economy is great, it's right. booming. And then, meanwhile, uh, if you if you compare that to how your own life is going, where you can't even uh, live recreationally, yeah, you're like, dude, wh- what, am I, sub- right? what am I doing wrong? That is the subtext of all of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so, if you were to actually just put out the real measurements, saying, hey, uh, we have a student loan debt load that's unprecedented, $1.6 trillion. Uh, Mental health is decreasing. Uh, Drug addictions at record highs. And you were to put these measurements out, then you would see just how poorly many of our people are doing. Mm. And then you'd put energy towards solving those problems. And then if you were doing poorly, you'd be like, oh, I knew it wasn't my imagination because Mm -hmm. turns out a lot of us are doing poorly. Right. Like It's very hard to solve a problem if you can't identify it and then uh, establish <laughs> measurements that help you improve. Mm-hmm. I think part of the problem, too, with kind of my generation is the whole, I feel like the whole generation is kind of stuck in a rut. Is that um, you do this whole idea of American determinism and self madeness is like you you blame yourself and and also your parents and your elders blame you too in a way. Maybe they that's don't, the worst part. They don't explicitly say it right, but you can tell it's like. It's somehow your fault. It's, it's like an like, attitude problem. I did it. I made it. What's up? You, you, yeah, and why back are you when, still living with me, you know? And back when you bought a house, it was freaking, you know, like... $20,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a, yeah. And you could actually do a part-time job and pay for college be, but because college was uh, 30% of the price <laughs> of what it is now. It, like, I'm a numbers guy. Hmm. We have set up the next generation to fail by the numbers. And the worst part is then we blame them for it. We've been right. like, hey, it's because... You know your uh, your attitude's not right, or mm-hmm. like you want everything, uh, and it's really immoral. Mm-hmm. It's super messed up. I go around the country and I say to young people, "I am sorry for the disaster we have left you." And when you think about that message, generally you think, "Okay, climate change," but it's not just climate change. Mm. It's a dysfunctional government that can't solve problems. It's an economy that, by the numbers, is stacked against you. It's the fact that college is 250% more expensive than it was when I went to college. Did Mm. it get 250% better? (laughs) No. Yeah, (laughs) certainly not. Not my college. (laughs) No one's college (laughs) college would have that better. And then we've said to the young person, hey, it must be your fault somehow that we've, like, jacked up these prices on you, and then you're going to graduate. Can't find a job. What's up? Yeah. You suck. That's why. Yeah, and and it's not that they suck. It's like, hey, what we've done is we've kicked all of the... Uh, stable jobs away. Now we're automating them away. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and it's much easier to automate away, uh, frankly, an entry level, um, like insurance agent or job that a college graduate might have done mm-hmm. in the past. 
and uh, now they have the debt, but they don't have the job to come with it. Mm -hmm. There's a 40 to 44 percent underemployment rate for recent college graduates right now. So if you are lucky enough to graduate with your debt load, there's almost a 50-50 chance you're going to do a job that didn't require a college degree. Mm -hmm. And you know where that does not show up? The headline unemployment rate, because they're like, job, check, barista, looks good. Right. Uh, and then they yell at you and being like, unemployment's at record low. And it's like, but my job is like not the job that I was supposed to uh, yeah. to do out of college. Right. Also, I saw on Patriot Act, which saw you <laughs> on there too, um, he was just talking about how the elderly are now also not able to really retire mm -hmm. in dignity because they also don't have enough savings. And um, I just, it's, it's crazy because now it's also catching up to the boomer generation who are criticizing us, you know. And but they, they have hoarded they the most are, wealth. <laughs> yeah, how are they not able to retire? I don't even understand that. It's like, you guys hoard. hoarded the wealth, we're screwed, and now we have to support their old asses. <laughs> well, what happens is they hoarded the wealth, but again, there's massive diversity within that generation. So by, by share of generational wealth, they have more of it than any other generation. But there are still many, many poor boomers who are going to work until the day they die because mm -hmm. they don't have meaningful savings. And that curve gets aggressively worse over time. Mm. <laughs> Where, uh, like, if you look at millennials and project forward, like, no one's going to have any savings. Right. Exactly. That's true. Like, my, my generation Gen X is, like, somewhere in between, but not great. Mm. Uh, and I see this all the time, campaigning in Iowa and New Hampshire and Ohio and everywhere else, where senior citizens, um, how old are your parents? 70. Uh, 70. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mine are 79 and 72. And there comes a point when your parents start being very, or at least I'll just speak for myself. There came a time when my parents became very, very cost conscious and judicious. Ooh, that happened a long mm -hmm. time yeah, ago. Yeah, maybe, maybe they were the whole time. <laughs> but there was a point when talking to my mom in particular, like it started to dawn on me that. Uh, that their earning power has essentially been determined. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have their kitty of savings and they have passive income and social security that they can draw on. And that's it. That defines their economic reality. Mm -hmm. I've met Americans around the country who have that same, uh, same reality. And as a young person, or now as a middle-aged person, but certainly when I was a young person, like it's kind of foreign because you're like, who the heck knows what the future holds? Sky's the limit. Maybe I'll get a raise tomorrow. Like, you don't know. <laughs> but for them, it's like, oh, they know. Uh, and because of that, they have this attitude of resource scarcity because they know exactly what's going to come in. And so I've met Americans around the country where they know what's coming in and it's not enough. Yeah. yeah. Where they have Social Security. And Social Security <clears throat> might be something like... Uh, a thousand, eleven hundred mm -hmm. yeah. a month, that's, and that's all they have. That's not enough for anything. Yeah. So the what uh, what Hassan said in uh, Patriot Act is right. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a retiree crisis in this country where senior citizens are going to be working till the day they die, and that retiree crisis just compounds over time. Mm. It's it's that's pretty wild. frightening. Yeah, I mean it's going to be a, a total shit show for uh, the current. Millennials are younger. As it gets worse and worse, you know. It's true. I think of my own parents. They own a house that they rent out, and they get a couple thousand dollars a month, and that and that with the Social Security, and I still help them, but they still they have like a a a, a fairly decent yeah. uh, source of of cash. But when I think of like how hard it is to even buy a house now for our mm -hmm. generation, I mean. Yeah, I don't see that ending well. And so many people work on freelance and there's no benefits and no... Yeah, a majority of new jobs are temp gig or contract jobs. All of the benchmarks that you used to associate with a middle class life are becoming harder and harder to come by. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, it's like, of course, home ownership. It's like, hey, let's mm -hmm. make the real estate crazy expensive. Go to college. Hey, let's make college crazy expensive. Uh, and people are getting increasingly distraught because the benchmarks are more and more out of reach and then we pretend like it's on it's all good mm -hmm. it's on them and, it's and better than it's ever been and and the the numbers are showing up in something and people have mixed of mixed feelings about this but uh so every life stage is getting pushed back um and so you're seeing 
things like marriage decline. You're mm-hmm. seeing things like having kids decline. Mm-hmm. Uh, American childbirths are at record lows right now. Mm. And so you can look up to, at that and say, like, well, there are a host of reasons. To me, that's tied into the fact that you don't feel like you have a stable middle class mm-hmm. Definitely. life. Getting married. It's a big financial decision to have a kid. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, and so getting married is in many cases an act of optimism and prosperity. Having kids is an act of optimism and prosperity. Mm. And there's just less of it to go around. Mm. For young people in particular, where... You know, they're trapped in their parents' basement um, with these debt loads, and they feel like uh, they don't have the stability to be a partner, much less a parent. Right. And on top of it, they feel like it's their fault. But let me let, here's an issue that came up that you had a, a differing response than the other candidates. On the issue of impeachment, which is kind of what's dominating the news cycle these days, um, your answer was that uh, – that, that we may be focusing too much on impeachment. Uh, what did you mean by that? The crucial number right now is zero, because that's the number of Republicans that have crossed party lines and said, hey, uh, impeachment is a good idea. It doesn't look good, right? No. Oh, to and, bring, I mean. And you, you don't need zero Republicans. You need 20 Republicans <laughs> in the Senate to switch sides. Mm-hmm. So if you look up and say, okay, you need 20, you have zero. <laughs> the numbers aren't good. Yeah, like so. What what I I said um, last night was that this is like a ball game that you're watching um, that you recorded that you know the score already, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, which is not a fun ball game to watch. Uh, and so there is a lot of history being made. In some ways, you can't fault journalists and politicians for saying you know that. that Uh, We need to focus all of our energy and attention on this. But as a rational person where you're like, look, you need 20, you have zero. Uh, This is going to be a bust. Donald Trump two months from now is going to be crowing about total vindication and total exoneration and Democratic witch hunt and Mm -hmm. the rest of it. So if you know that that's the way it's probably going to play out, then uh, you need to start building towards the election. And you need to start trying to solve the problems that got Trump elected in the first place. And I don't think Democrats really took to heart the message of Donald Trump's victory. We talked about this last time when you you thought it was inconceivable. uh, You know, many of us thought it was inconceivable that Trump would win. And he did win uh, based upon a narrow margin of victory in a few states. But to me... It's a giant red flag if tens of millions of Americans say, let's take a bet on the narcissist reality TV star because we have (laughs) lost faith in our government's ability to solve our problems. Mm. If you lose to that figure in any way, then you have to soul search and say, what the heck is going on with us? Like, Mm. how the heck do we lose to that guy? Uh, And unfortunately, I think all the energy around impeachment is falling back into this Mm. narrative Instead of saying, like, well, let's try to solve the problems, it's that Trump is the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm pro-impeachment. Like, I think what he did was wrong. Uh, I think that we do have a constitution and voting to uphold it is a positive thing. But I'm also a realist. Mm -hmm. If you need 20, you have zero, then let's just freaking try and wrap this game up and uh, get on to the (laughs) next game (laughs) where you uh, actually can win. Mm. Yeah, and that's the ballot box in 2020. That's right. when we're gonna win. <laughs> and it's right around the corner. You know, it's uh, we can the people can vote then. But if you're in California, you can vote starting. Uh, I think it's February 3rd. Oh wow! There's because you you legit vote. I think it's March 3rd. But then you can early vote uh, like a month before. And I think mm. you can vote by mail in California. Mm. <laughs> and I will say, if you're in California, this is all very uncharted territory. Because traditionally, Californians have had essentially zero input on who becomes president. Because it's already fore- mm. foretold by then? Yeah, because California was relatively late in the mm-hmm. nomination process. And so here's here's the fun part. You get, number one, Iowa. Two, New Hampshire. Three, Nevada. Four, South Carolina. And then California was like, eh, 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 mm. eh, like 21 or something. Mm. And like, it didn't matter. But this time, California got moved up to five. Oh. Really? 
How exciting. Oh. Yeah, because California <laughs> was sick of not being in the game, so they oh. said, we're going to move up to five. And this thing's not going to be settled by the time it gets to California. So this mm. is all very new for Californians. That's very cool, actually. That's exciting. Mm. By the way, last time I was not a citizen, and now I am. You made America yeah. cooler. <laughs> he loves you America. Look bold. Yes. It's so cool. <laughs> but That's I, a great day for the country. <laughs> Thank you. Well, she she entered much like you did on the gas. Yeah, I did. Oh, well, you had a, did you have a citizenship celebration? Yeah, yeah we did. Oh, we that's did. Great, yeah. <laughs> I mean, freaking America should have been celebrating. We need Actually, you know, uh, AOC tweeted, yeah. Ela, congratulations. Yes. How cool is that? Big honor. Uh, that, that, I mean, yeah, Although it's she, an honor uh, for the country she, that you decided to become American. <laughs> it's I, awesome. I think it's the greatest place to live. Yes. I really do. Yes, let, let's I, it uh, up. <laughs> I value... The opportunity to live here very much. That's beautiful. Mm. That's hit, hit me with that American music, Zach, for Christ's sake. Uh, has M- Have you settled the beef? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're done with that. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> have you settled the beef with MSNBC? To my count, they've left you out of a graph 15 times. Is that right, or is it more than 15? I think that's about the last count I saw. <laughs> and I feel like you didn't want to. You didn't want to go there with them, but at a certain point. You gotta address an issue that, that that's affecting your campaign. I mean, it's outrageous. It's what is what's that? going on over there? You know, it is very very <laughs> baffling to us all. Uh, and uh, we're in talks with them to try and uh, put it behind us because it doesn't do anyone any good uh, for them to be treating us differently than other candidates. I, and frankly, for me, not being on there talking to voters, because a lot of yeah. Uh, yeah. Dems get their info from MSNBC. But I got to yeah. say, it's been a massive uh, like source of confusion and concern. What? Uh, it's just so <laughs> weird that... Uh, it's so every weird. Every time, it's like your face just isn't there. And then after the debate, they're interviewing Cory Bookie, who Booker, who I'm a fan of, but he wasn't even in the debate. Were you on M- MSNBC uh, at all last night? No, I wasn't. I mean, what the hell is that? Did they invite you? I do not know. Um, I, I'd have to ask my team. You were on CNN. I saw you there. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my team uh, handles the press engagements. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if they asked. Okay, let's talk about policy. <laughs> China. Uh I'm worried. I find myself concerned about China. I find myself concerned about their way that they treat their their uh, citizen citizenry with the with the social rating system, with the facial recognition. You know, they say that the, uh, the Chinese citizens now have social scores. Uh, you can lose points by participating in um, activism or protests. And what can happen when you get a low social score? You can not leave the country. You can not use uh, public transportation, stuff like this. And so the way that they are finding to control their citizenry is some very frightening things for the future of, of, of civilization, as I see it, a threat to that. I also wonder about um, if the United States should be more active in supporting Hong Kong protesters. That seems to me a great opportunity for for America to prop up an an ally and a democratic uh, society over there in, in that part of in China and so I wonder uh, if you were to become president what would be your approach to these issues in China and what are your thoughts on that the most reprehensible thing going on in China right now is the concentration camps for the right. Uh, the Uyghur uh, ethnic minority. Mm. It is awful. I don't know if you've seen some of this. Stuff. I have. I should have brought that up. Yeah, as no, well. it's freaking like straight out of the Stone Ages type stuff. It's beyond. It's uh, well, well, they round up a bunch of um, they're Muslims, right? Yes. And they're uh, doing cultural uh, re-education because they want a homogenous society, and religion is is frowned upon in a communist society. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong anywhere. Yeah, it's even darker than that. In some cases, they send the the Uyghur men to like a work camp or a concentration camp, and then they send uh, soldiers to to hang out with their wives in their absence. I mean, like really, really oh. dark shit hmm. that you see, and you're like, this is uh, inhuman. In, a, in an effort to to what resettle the family. 
or or what? Some yeah, just to to try and essentially uh, excise their country of this minority. They want to work the men to death and remarry the women. Is that the idea? Yeah, they or they want them to to essentially break up the family unit so that the next generation uh, is not brought up in the same religion in the same right. way. Right. Uh, so, but everything else you named also that they're Hong Kong is tricky because Hong Kong was a British colony for mm-hmm. a long time, and then the Brits handed it back to China, and then now it's in this handover period where it's co- considered a semi-autonomous zone. Mm. But if you look up and say, okay, what country is Hong Kong part of, you would have to conclude China because it was a British colony that it was returned to the Chinese uh, a number of years ago. And so the question is, how can we support the people in Hong Kong to keep the abuses from scaling up there? And in some ways, the Chinese haven't done what you would fear, which is go in and do a, a military oppression Tiananmen style. Uh, but there's plenty of dark stuff happening happening in Hong Kong. And I said last night they banned face masks there so they could use uh, facial recognition technology to identify protesters and then mm-hmm. round them up afterwards. Uh, the biggest thing we can do to bring pressure on the Chinese is to make it, it clear to them that if they abuse human rights, there are going to be consequences. And those consequences have to be economic, really, because that's the main language that Chinese understand. Uh, they have two primary overriding priorities at all times. Number one, maintain robust economic growth. And the number two, preserve social order. <laughs> so the question is, uh, can you make number one powerful enough so that they cur- curb the abuses in number two? The social credit system is part of... Uh, is part of that setup. Um, and uh, do you all see, watch Black Mirror? Do you see those mm-hmm. episodes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it reminds you of that Black Mirror episode. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and to, to me, that is hand in hand with their total lack of privacy regs. The fact that any interaction you have in any context gets recorded. Uh, they have a real powerful surveillance state there. And they're ramping up their technology to make it unprecedented in human history. Right. So to me, here's the approach. Number one, you say, look, (laughs) you benefit from our trade relationship, from your global commerce. If you go past a certain point in terms of your human rights abuses, you're going to pay a real price. Mm. Number two, on the technology side, they're actually trying very hard to build up a parallel tech ecosystem, Mm. which is really disastrous, potentially, for everyone over time. Mm-hmm. They used Google Apps until very recently, uh, and now they've transitioned to their own homegrown operating system. What does that mean, that mm-hmm. the government outlaws, prohibits uh, Google-based devices? Well, they're not using them now, and it's an open question whether the Chinese government prohibited them or the U.S. government said, hey, Google, you're not allowed to work with the Chinese on these things. Mm. Um, but. A lot of the Google apps we all know are essentially open source where, uh, or if not open source, they make the license freely available. Mm -hmm. So if you were the Chinese and you had to come up with your own set of apps and operating system, uh, it would really suck, especially because Google had it all figured out for you. So they were using Google uh, and now they develop their own homegrown operating system and apps that they're exporting to other countries that are trying. So the risk is that um, if for whatever reason consumers start using that and we become for whatever reason reliant, are you worried about data privacy breaches? Yes. Yeah. So you can imagine a world where, because uh, we know that Chinese technology firms and the Chinese government have a very close relationship. <laughs> and so right. if you succeed in exporting that technology platform to the rest of the world, then you essentially have the Chinese government's eyes Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. hooks into everything. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to try and prevent. Uh, And the way to prevent it is to set up a world data organization that's analogous to the World Trade Organization and say, here are the standards and protocols for data and technology. Mm -hmm. Get the EU and Japan to buy in and then make it so that if you are an unaffiliated country that it's obvious that you have to go with the world tech standards and not 
the Chinese tech standard. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then if you're China and you look up and say, wait a minute, uh, I can't export my stuff effectively Mm. because it doesn't follow these protocols. Our stuff doesn't work with anyone else's stuff. At the extreme end, they would say, maybe it's better for us if we join the world on this one because Mm -hmm. then at least our stuff will be interoperable. And also right now, I'm going to bet their software is terrible (laughs) compared to... (laughs) compared to uh, Google's and everyone else's. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, if you're a, a third world country and they're generally developing countries and China comes and says, hey, use our tech, you're like, I do not want to use your tech <laughs> at all. Your tech is terrible. Unless it's free, you know. <laughs> oh, but, you know, ours is virtually free too. But, but like, if you're the Congo and China's like, hey, we're, like, building all of your stuff. We're building you a coal power plant. Use this software. <laughs> 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 then, then Congo's like, I guess we have to. Right. Um, right. So, so that's the game they're playing. Mm. And we have to make it so that that game loses. Mm. Uh, that game losing actually is the best way we can protect human rights. Uh, because then if you're China and you look up and say, well, I need to join this uh, world organization, then you say, well, if you want to join this world or- organization, you need to have some kind of uh, privacy rules in check. You need to not be abusing your own people in these ways. Mm. Is there any efforts to put an organization like that together? Yeah, I'm happy to say that uh, we're starting to take some steps. Like We have some proposals out. Certainly, if I'm president, uh, we can get this done relatively quickly because mm. the EU and Japan would love I, nothing yeah. more. Yeah, right. Uh, and this is the brainchild of a guy named Ian Bremmer, who's this uh, brilliant thinker on global security matters. And so Ian's running with this ball uh, right now. Mm. That's great. Um, you know, and, and that kind of leads into another uh, issue with China that, that scares me, frankly, is the, the race for AI supremacy. Um, you know, I feel like China has such a strong uh, central government, I mean, authoritarian, really, that they are able to make these big swinging decisions. Like, for example, just to invest, they decide to invest all this money in AI technology. And uh, here in in other developed countries, we're lagging behind. And you look at, we had a nuclear race, and it could very well be that the the next this could be the, the next, next wor- nuclear race. Right. I mean, the next uh, new world will be established by AI. Uh, once you dev- once you break through on that, and it can start solving its own problems, you you all of a sudden are you go light years instead of years ahead, right? Yeah. And so um, you're right to be concerned. So is that something that leaders are currently? working towards even, evening the playing field there? Are people thinking about this issue? There are people thinking about it, but they're not in our government. Well, that's <laughs> a problem, right? Unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, so we at this point have an innovation model that's very much driven by the leading technology companies. Mm-hmm. Now, like, if you rewind several generations, you had all of these uh, government scientists in lab coats like buried under a mountain in New Mexico or wherever, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like coming up with things. Uh, and then now all of those scientists work for uh, SpaceX, Amazon, Google, um, Facebook, Facebook uh, Microsoft to some extent. So they are deeply concerned that China is going to leapfrog us in AI. I'm deeply concerned. There was a joke that people in AI used to tell. Uh, it was, how far behind is China in AI from the U.S.? And the answer was 12 hours Mm -hmm. because they would wake up and then see what we did. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Um, Now that joke doesn't really work because... Is it that available? They can just see what we did? Um, The private companies, they don't make their stuff publicly available. Right. Um, But there there were some uh, labs and and universities that would publish new stuff and then they would... Mm. And so China was just like, oh, great. Well, so so here's the, the broader context. Uh... The West is better on research and breakthroughs uh, than China. We came up with this machine learning uh, AI development tool uh, that now China has. um, And machine learning gets stronger and smarter based upon how much data you feed to it. Like data is like food for the algorithms. Mm. So China now has a massive lead in the level of data. Mm. And China also has a massive lead in the level of computing infrastructure that they make available to their firms. So in China, AI is a national obsession. Mm. 
more Chinese mm-hmm. watched AI beat the best human Go player, the Chinese game of Go, right? Than watch the Super Bowl in the U.S. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, really? so it, AI's uh, massive national and cultural priority is this mm-hmm. is this an effort from the government to to um, ma- get interest in this thing that they see as vitally important to their future success? Yes, that's mm-hmm. very interesting. It's almost like a propaganda machine in this case and though, it is they're right and it's though. smart yeah, yeah. Like, like i wish we did the same thing <laughs> uh so they have more data and then the government says look we're gonna spend billions even tens of billions of dollars on computing infrastructure as far as the eye can see mm-hmm. like islands covered with server farms like straight out of the mm-hmm. matrix mm-hmm. and i've sat with the leading technologists in silicon valley who looked at me and said look we'll spend one billion two billion dollars on computing infrastructure, but we can't spend ten billion, hmm. and that's what the Chinese are doing. And the mm-hmm. Chinese are saying, "Hey, go ahead and use it, AI companies, not our AI, like Chinese AI companies. Mm-hmm. Right. Use this ten billion dollar infrastructure. You have more data now. You have more computing power, so our AI will be smarter, faster." Mm-hmm. And they are generally correct. I asked a group of Iowans last week. I said, "Okay." So right now they have more access to more data than we do, and they have more computing infrastructure. The only way for the U.S. to win this would be if we have another breakthrough uh, past machine learning. How many of you think that uh, that the U.S. is going to take the lead based on another breakthrough? And like no hands went up. <laughs> and I said, how many of you think that the Chinese will take a lead based upon more data and more computing infrastructure? Like <laughs> every hand went up. <laughs> and I looked at them and I said. I agree with you. Like, If you have more data and more computing infrastructure, you're probably going to win this thing. So what we have to do is we have to go to our technology firms, and as president, it'll be my, uh, my pleasure to do this. I'll say, look, we get it. We will match the Chinese multi-billion dollar computing infrastructure, take it off your balance sheets to maintain global leadership in this field. And in return, then we'll ask them for a few things too. Uh, mm-hmm. Essentially, we'll ask them to... Uh, allow us to have someone that keeps them from destroying humanity or do, doing something that something really, small <laughs> like that. <laughs> like really, um, so I, I, I sat with um, with a technologist who, who said to me flat out, he said, look, our incentives right now on AI are just to go as fast as possible hmm. because we're competing with the other tech firms. We're competing with the Chinese. And if all of our incentives are to go as fast as possible, it's, at one point, one of us is going to do something really problematic slash disastrous. <laughs> and, uh, do you have a... And, and a he scenario? said, he said, like, please, we could use some guidelines on this because if you mm-hmm. put guidelines on us and the other firms we're competing against, then we'd be less likely to break something. Right. Huh. Worried about the other guys, you know, probably. Um, what is one of these scenarios, for example, where... Uh, someone who's moving too fast in the development of AI uh, does something that becomes harmful, disastrous to our society. What's an example of that? So you could have AI that, uh, I mean, I I don't want to scare people, but... Go ahead. Let's get scared. (laughs) So uh, let's just say, so I'll just say something. that, um, Like you could have weaponized AI that... Uh, can hack just about any public infrastructure that uh, you can't encrypt and protect Mm -hmm. uh, because the AI is sophisticated enough where it can break through. And then you could imagine if that AI gets into the wrong person's hands or wrong organization's hands, then it could be essentially like holding our infrastructure hostage. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not even holding our infrastructure hostage, maybe just set it loose. (laughs) And then we wind up... Uh, with the lights off for mm. Mm. quite some time. I mean, there, there are scenarios like that. There are other darker scenarios around, and these are more the science fiction level where, like, the AI gets its own agenda. Mm. Um, but uh, there are realistic scenarios where uh, AI does something it's not intended to do um, in ways that hold uh, that does very large scale damage. Mm. I'm thinking um, and now I, I want to think practically about what this means. So China is on we're in an AI race, arms race. Uh, what's the end game? Is it hacking? Is it digital warfare? I mean, what is it that will give them the edge, practically speaking? So if you were to win in AI, <laughs> uh, economy wide, that would mean that you could accomplish 
efficiencies of scale that other economies would not, and that your firms would be smarter, your software would be more effective, everything would just start working better. Uh, and then it's very hard to compete with that if you are another country. Hmm. Uh, let's imagine, for example, that you had AI that had figured out mobility to the point where you could have autonomous trucks and cars right. everywhere. And then there was one country that had that software and it was actually safe. <clears throat> uh, the level of savings for an economy of having autonomous vehicles would be hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you had access to that software and then say, hey, this will save your economy hundreds of billions, I'll license it to you for 20 billion, 30 billion or whatever right. it is, then other countries would start doing that. Mm. Uh, and then that would be... They're the new, uh, it's the new oil, as you say. Yeah, data is the new oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you had the AI and you could harness the data effectively, then you win at an almost unprecedented scale. Mm. That Good sounds important. I mean, it sounds important. That, that's real money. No, that that's why uh, the Chinese are fat, like essentially obsessed with this. I mean, they're looking for ways that they could become the new uh, world player. Yeah. And I think they see that as almost like a cheat code to piggyback to the front of the line. It's like how many of you? It's like, like you, a hail mary. I'm sure you all do. Like, uh, sure you do, Ethan. Maybe not you. Eli. Like, you played one of those video games where you're like trying to upgrade your, <laughs> your units and like, you're competing against this other force. Yeah. But, well, like, they, yeah, I've played many games. Like that. <laughs> I know you have. Me too. <laughs> So AI is like that, where yeah. it's like, oh man, I'm starting to fall behind. It's like, ooh, if I get this new unit type, <laughs> you've got <laughs> that. To upgrade that. Right, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, AI is um, is like that for the Chinese. Mm. I mean, it seems concerning that that is not even a topic on the debate, or that <laughs> well, no one really talks about it. Except yeah. for this guy, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, the fact is, our government is 25 years behind in technology. Uh, our media company and twenty and all the politicians are twenty five years too old. If I'm being honest, I mean I I, I don't want to sound ageist, but uh, I also don't mind if I sound ageist either, <laughs> because it, I think politicians are get they're too old. You know what I mean? I want I want someone. There's too much going on in the world. I mean Joe Biden probably has a at AOL.com email. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Most I mean, likely he does. Hey, Joe's Joe's seventy seven. I want to say so. He's like our parents. Right, mm -hmm. and that terrifies me. So, if your parents have you understand their lit their technological <laughs> literacy, you, that's not who you want up against the Chinese AI machine. Yeah, it's it's not just the folks who are on the stage. I think someone looked up the average age of a congressperson or a legislator in DC, and I think it was sixty something mm -hmm. like that. So, why is that? What's going on? Are young people not getting in the game, or people not electing young people? I know that there's kind of a second wave now. Um, but I just think that our our government body wasn't meant to be run by by the olds <laughs> by by old people who don't really understand. And more now more than ever, maybe a hundred years ago, this the technological aspect wasn't, wasn't important. important, and no. the the landscape wasn't moving as fast. And wisdom and old age, and uh, you know, good. There, there is a technical term for this: is the gerontocracy, mm. like the rule by old people. Mm. <laughs> and uh, the U.S. is, I believe. Uh, technically a gerontocracy. Wow. How about that? It's not great. I, I mean, uh, you know, again, and it's tough because, you know, we like old people. Uh, um, we uh, love the olds. I feel like that's like a, a, a <laughs> slur, the olds. <laughs> but the rate of change is just accelerating. It's getting faster all the time. Yeah. So if you could afford to be 10, 20 years behind, like a number of decades ago, you can't afford to be 20 years right. behind now because mm -hmm. what the heck happened in the last 20 years? You know, the world mm -hmm. has changed. Mm -hmm. And right now the government in the U.S., unfortunately, is like like the flopping appendage behind like, <laughs> like, like, like the rest of, you know, it's, it's like the tail and like the animals moving forward and the tail's like, hey, me too, me too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's not going to work ideally for us in terms of some of the biggest problems uh, like AI, like climate change, like some of the folks, the the um, problems that you genuinely need a federal government that has its act together. Mm. And that that's where we are right now as a country. That's why I'm running for president, because I looked up and said, OK, here are the big problems. Uh, you can't solve them unless the government gets its shit together. The government will not get its shit together. Mm. 
And then be like, all right, so what's the plan? Somebody's <laughs> got to do something. And so then I said, well, if I run for president and bring enough Americans together fast enough, then we can get into D.C., rewrite the operating system, try and modernize and upgrade it, just be all about solutions, data-oriented, modernize it. There, someone told me a story. It was like an, an Asian kid. Um, he, he went to work in D.C. in one of these congressional offices. Um, and then uh, they gave him some, like, uh, work to do about, like, opening mail or, like, entering, like, something into a form. Mm -hmm. So then he, being a smart kid, he, like, wrote a script <laughs> where then it, like, did itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they yelled at him for it. <laughs> They wow. were like, no, you were just supposed to enter it into the forum. He's like, I just made it so that no one needs to enter it. They didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, they didn't understand. Oh, and that, uh, now that kid works at Silicon Valley <laughs> at Google. But he said, like, I worked in the government for <laughs> that's insane for a, that, a, a few months. And he was like, it was terrible. That's outrageous. Here's what happened to me. Yeah. And, and this was in a, a, in a congressperson's office. Uh, D.C., is embarrassing. That's, that's outrageous. I mean, that it's funny, but it's also terrifying. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so if I get in there and can try and make it, like what I was saying to that kid is, I was like, look, man, we have to like essentially have a kid like you in every kind yes. person's office. We need to just, look for you. Yeah. We need to <laughs> embrace you. And to get you in there and being like, hey, he's just going to try and make stuff work a little better and faster and, uh, you know, just see how it goes and like, and then just try and push the culture Forward. You can't change it overnight, but I think you can get a lot done uh, faster than people think because they're so far behind. Like, yeah. you almost can't help but do good in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> it's what do you, what do they raise the, what do you need to get into the next debate in January? It's 5% now from yeah. 4%? Yeah, it's 5%. So we got to get you one more percent before the 10th. Is that right? Of January? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, you guys are right on top of it. Ah, <laughs> so the, we're going to get that. We 1% <laughs> after the last night. Yeah, we already have uh, one of the polls we need. We need three. You do? Four. Yeah. Mm. So we, we got a 5% nationwide. I think it was. Is uh, that the first one? Uh, yeah. So we need three more in the early states or. That's got to feel crazy. Right? <laughs> it, it is. It, it's like it's like one of the games that we go. It's like, all right, what do I need now? I need 5% or <laughs> polls. Um, the best way that people can help in that direction really is just make a donation between now and December 31st mm. at yang2020.com because we'll take any donations and then we'll put uh, the money to work getting our poll numbers up in the early states. That's where the money's going. Have you seen any data following last night's debate about uh, are you polling better? I mean, does it work, those debates? Uh, well, we, we've gotten an incredible response after yes. last night's debate. I yeah. think we've raised half a million since the debate already, maybe more. Uh, is that what it is? That it? You just we want the money so we can run the ads, or if you know people in Iowa, New Hampshire, <laughs> South Carolina, Nevada, call them up and be like, Hey, it's been a little while, mm. but have you heard of Andrew Yak? <laughs> like, right, you know, like, right. like anything that boosts <laughs> our uh, awareness in those states is super helpful. Uh, money is helpful. Uh, spreading the message via social media and other ways is helpful. Uh, but it's game time. It's crunch time. I and mean, mm -hmm. we, we have to save humanity, and we have approximately two months to do it in. Uh, so it, it is a great time, though, because, frankly, you know, we're, we're, we're right at this crucial period where we can change the course of this country. Mm. And it's a privilege to be here. Like the Yang Gang has gotten us right to this point where you can <laughs> see the path it's, to victory. Oh, it's yeah. so wild. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I I just reviewed some polling numbers earlier today, um, and the the polling for this campaign is just shooting up in terms of favorables. Both name awareness and favorability have been um, skyrocketing lately, and even now my favorability is actually higher than that of just about any other politician. Mm. Um, and well, you so, managed to throw in a little, um, little jokes, little way out to the crowd. <laughs> oh yeah, I love that. The debate, the, the, <laughs> the like... college debaters. <laughs> Give a shout out to them. There are a lot of college kids. Oh, I know. Is that a college uh, campus, right? Yeah, I was at LMU. I was think, yeah, I think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so we're just on the cusp of breaking through. It feels great, and thank you both for being some of the OGs in this. Episode. It's my pleasure. Mm. Part of the Yang Gang, my brother, the Genesis is from my brother, as, as I told well, you thank last him. Time. He yeah. was going to try to get here to yeah. see you, but uh, he couldn't make it down. He's a teacher in Las Vegas. That's incredible. Uh, Have I met him? Because I No. no. Oh, you well, may. You, yeah, you yeah, may. He's yeah. definitely been at your rallies, but yeah. I don't know if... Uh, 
I don't know if you've met him. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to. I'd have to check out the tape. <laughs> and review the tape. Um, but I, I agree. I think I've always felt that if people could just hear your message and see you, then people are going to start to uh, see that that you're different and you're you're what we need, right? So. I thought last night's debate was a fantastic win. It's incredible to see you up on that stage. Only seven people now. It was such a circus before with 12, yeah. what, 15? How many people were on the stage at one point? Uh, you know, there was a 12-person debate. 12 people. I mean, it's out. So, and there was the debate where they had 20 and they split into two nights at 10. Right, yeah. Oh, what are we doing? <laughs> so there's seven people there. You're one of them. I mean, my goodness, right? That's <laughs> yes. amazing. Yeah, we're in the freaking <laughs> final seven. Anyway, we got to get you those polls. Um, I know we're low on time, but I've got some more things here, and I just don't want to stop, so, uh... Me neither. Let's just, go. Okay, Fire good. away. Me uh, Mexican cartels is another thing that, that, that concerns me. I mean, is this a national security issue for, for America? We have what seems to be more and more a lawless country on our southern border. My parents lived in Mexico for five years, and they wow. were forced to leave as the, uh... The violence moved into their small town in the uh, state of Jalisco. There was a uh, grenade fire. Mm. I mean, they were, there was a full no, on gate. That's I, awful. Yeah. And so, um, and, you know, there was this recent thing with the, uh, the Mormons who were yeah, murdered terrible. there. Uh, terrible. And they're not just criminals, they're, um, they're so violent and they're so ruthless. Um, what, do, what what can we do about this as a I mean it's a continental issue I've, I find um, why is Mexico and America not collaborating on this is it a frac what's going on here what do we do about this do you see it as an issue oh yeah of course it's a major issue uh, <laughs> on several levels it's one of those situations where helping others helps us yes you know like we, we have to do everything we can to help stabilize what's happening in Mexico. The tough part is that there's a lot of corruption there. So you get there and you're like, hey, let's break the backs of the cartels or let's do something positive. And the cartels have bought and sold a, a lot of the uh, officials there that you'd hope to be working with. And the ones that aren't are murdered. Yeah. It seems like. Yeah. So it's a tough context to get positive things done in. But it's it's a situation where if you do put economic aid and resources to work, it actually goes a very, very long way. Uh, and one of the reasons why people um, are trying to migrate into the U.S. is because their towns are being overrun right. by violence. It's not, I think these immigrants have been so demonized, it's out, It's just, uh, it's, you it's, know, it's just so, such a shame. I mean, they're, they're escaping violence, they're not I don't know what people think that about these, like, I remember when Trump was, uh, during the election, there was this whole thing about the the caravan, right? right? Yeah, the caravan. I mean, he always has these cheap political stunts. One approach we could take that would change uh, the resources available to the cartels, ex explore the legalization of certain drugs. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm open to looking at legalizing different drugs that are not just fueling the cartel, but also... Uh, in some cases would frankly be an upgrade over the uh, opiates that many Americans are currently getting addicted to. What are we talking about? For, marijuana? Oh, marijuana is the easy that's one. That's obvious. I mean, that's People like, are already there. Yeah, that, that one's the easy <laughs> one. Um, and this is not a huge economic driver of the cartels, but psilocybin mushrooms and psychedelics yes. uh, have been proven to... What are they selling? Uh, is it heroin? Is it meth? I know it, it's, it's marijuana. Yeah, it, it's... Uh, and so this is the most dramatic one, is I'm actually looking to decriminalize opiates for personal use mm. uh, because we have eight Americans dying of drug overdoses every hour in this wow. country. We've essentially initiated this massive opiate addiction plague, and it was a disease of capitalism. It started out Purdue Pharma prescribing OxyContin right. and saying it's a non-addictive wonder drug. Mm. And then there was one point in our history, not that long ago, like, you know, six, seven years ago, there were more opiate prescriptions in the state of Ohio than there were human beings in the state of Ohio. I saw a 60 I saw, Minutes report yeah. on that. It blew my mind. And they have these pain clinics on every yeah. corner with these crooked doctors just writing scripts for people. It was unbelievable. Yeah, so what happened was OxyContin addiction morphed into fentanyl and heroin, and then a lot mm. of that is mm. what's getting trafficked now. Mm. So wow. we've, we've created this nation of addicts, uh, and they've actually found that 
OxyContin is now harder to get a hold of than the illegal stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So you have this massive drug trade and then it's driving the resources. Mm-hmm. So what I'm proposing is we legalize opiates <laughs> for personal use, which means if we catch you with the drugs, you get the drugs taken away from you, but we don't send you to jail. We send you to uh, treatment mm. and counseling. And then we uh, set up safe injection sites and safe consu- consumption sites in the U.S. that are controversial, but they've been proven to work and save lives. Uh, and then if you did this, you could uh, bring in some of this drug use out of the shadows and then get your user base down and then get the economic resources that are going to the cartels down uh, it's a dramatic move, but I was pushed in this direction by a high school senior in Iowa. Uh, I believe it was a town called Storm Lake. And he said he's a high school senior and his classmates have fentanyl patches on their arms because uh, really? they're already addicted. What? And, wow. and I was like, and then he said, like, what can you do to help my classmates? Wow. And so I talked to him at the event. I was like, what can we do? And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing. Like, they're not going to let anyone know they've got a problem because mm-hmm. fentanyl is illegal and they don't want to, like, get a criminal mm-hmm. record. They're going to, they're gonna go to they're jail gonna go to for jail. years. Yeah. For what? Yeah. So so then I said, oh, my gosh. Like, how can you get that freaking kid's classmates help? And then you know they're never going to go to the cops if, like, they're going to freaking get busted for it. So then it's like, well, if you actually decriminalized it, so if they went and said, hey, like, help me get off this stuff, uh, and then it'd be like, all right, like, and then you don't get a criminal record, then you can actually start making progress. So who sells them the opiates if we want to cut out the cartel and you're de- uh, you're legal, um... Well, decriminalizing, decriminalizing it. So where do they, where are they buying the drugs? So right now they're drawing it from, they're buying it from dealers. Yeah. And then in my new world, they'd still be buying it from, from dealers. The dealers still go to jail. It's just the individual users... Uh, don't get sent to jail with the dealer. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying legalize it in the way of like make it, uh, make it like heroin available and like because the cartel like is that. still essentially making the money from supplying the dealers. Yeah. So I'm wondering. I mean, ultimately, your vision is that people start using it less. Yeah, like you have to try and attack demand. And they can actually ask for help. Yeah, you you have to try to, uh, and when other countries have decriminalized opiates in this way, they saw reductions not just in overdose rates, but in abuse rates. Uh, And then you try and, and obviously we prefer a country where fewer of us are addicted uh, to drugs. Yeah. And this this addiction plague is so rampant, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I'm in uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, and people will come to me and say, my brother died, my son died. Like, everyone has a story about someone who died that's close to them. And yeah. it's disgusting. Like the fact it's that we let this drugs. happen in, in our country because essentially of capitalism run amok, like the, uh, Purdue Pharma made uh, made $30 billion on this and then paid a $635 million fine. So they paid a 2% mm. fine. Mm-hmm. Good it's deal. Like, yeah, it's a good deal. And like their, their family is now one of the richest families in the country, uh, the Sackler family. Mm. So this is a disease where the government essentially turned a blind eye and let a drug company kill tens of thousands of Americans for profit. And now we're left with the mess and it actually is and fueling the bill. And, the bill. and it's a it's a human toll. Uh you know, it's like you can't bring that person's son back. You can't bring that person's brother back. And it's fueling what's happening uh with the drug cartels because this is the majority of their business. Mm. Because it morphed from oxy to heroin and fentanyl and a bunch of the other illegals. Right. Which makes total sense. You can tell that um you know, it's the same thing. I don't know if people know that. It's the same thing. It's just that these drug companies have a pretty little packaging and it comes from a doctor. But it's the same shit as the, that you get down in Mexico and shoot up in your arm. Pretty much. Yeah, you know, we're, we're over-medicating our people to a very high level here in this country. And for some people, if the drug's what's going to help you, then by all means. Uh, but it should not be the first move or the first resort. Uh, because the fact is... A lot of the drug interactions, and I've talked to many Americans who've had this experience, like the doctor doesn't really know how the drug's going to interact with you. It's like, uh, you know, they have you in the office and be like, take this. It's worked for some of my patients. And then uh, you have a, like, you, you stub your toe. Here's Oxycontin. Oh, yeah. Like it's I have like, friends what? who are like, why yeah. are you giving me like, why are you giving me the, this painkiller? It's like, I'm going to be all right. They'd be like, yeah, just take it. Just take it. It's right. like, what, like, is, what yeah. is going on? Right. Yeah. If anything, we should be what like, do you really on? need this? Like, you have right. to, you should have to beg me for this thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> because 
the the fact is after they prescribed oxy there was like uh i forget what the percentage but there was like a you know like let's call it like uh non-trivial is like maybe like a three percent chance you're dead within uh w- w- no <laughs> yeah no it was, it was true oh my it, it god it was something now like that's was, a good doctor there was like a there was like a you know a two Holy or three percent crap. chance you were dead within five years. Wow, like it, it, that is so <laughs> horrific. Yeah, it's it's incredible. Like you go in for something non lethal, and they prescribe you something lethal in like a non trivial number of cases. Wow. Well, in the in the that that's shocking. In the essence of time, I want to ask you something I've never heard you talk about. What is your religious faith, and do you believe that faith is required to be president? I was brought up in an entirely secular household. You know, my parents immigrated here and then met as graduate students, and I can't remember them ever talking about their own uh, faith as a kid. I had many Christian relatives, and so we spent some holidays in church services. And then I met my wife, Evelyn, uh, and she's Christian, and so we're bringing our boys up in the church, and we now go to church as a family. Uh, Every weekend I'm home, which unfortunately now is not that many weekends for me. I always had this native belief in a higher power uh, or God or that there there was something driving us. Uh, I always had this deep sense of right and wrong. Uh, and that, I think that sense of right and wrong was actually driven by a lot of the uh, comic books and science fiction novels and whatnot <laughs> I read as a kid where, like, you know, they're like good guys and trying to do something positive. Uh, so when people ask the my The new faith, Bible, in other words. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no. uh, yeah, the church that we belong to is very progressive. They've got a rainbow flag up, up front. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, I'm very excited to have my little boys in that kind of environment because, like, I can see that they love it. Oh, mm-hmm. good. Yeah, I mean, your your guys only six months, but, I mean, I guess you, you guys... Well, we're secular. We yeah, are it's, from but a it's, Jewish background, but... It's definitely a question because I... My parents were pretty orthodox, but I'm not. So now I wonder, like, how do you, like, do you still do the holidays? Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. But well, what, do you do you believe, do you think that faith is required to be president? Because to uh, at least uh, what's publicly known, that there's never been a secular or atheistic or agnostic president. They've all, and it seems that uh, it's, uh, candidates are touting their piousness these days. Um as, as a requirement. I certainly don't think it should be a requirement. I mean, if you look up, uh, millions of Americans self-identify as non-religious or, or atheist. And I have friends who are some of the best human beings I know who uh, don't observe a particular faith or, or religion. Some of them have even gone so far as to set up like their own uh, type of community of like humanist beliefs where, you know, you can have very, very deep values uh, and love and not be part of a religious faith or community. So I don't think it should be a requirement at all. Uh, If anything, I think we're somehow stigmatizing people who uh, weren't brought up in a religion as somehow being less moral than others, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. I I don't believe that for a second. Like, Mm -hmm. again, some of my best friends that I admire the most are people that... uh, don't participate in any religious community. The freedom dividend. I'm sure that would be a great thing in you know in a press conference. <laughs> well, like, the, well, look, atheism, uh, agnostic, non-religious people is actually the growest, the fastest, fastest growing, growing uh, group of well, if you want to say religious uh, category of people, right? So I do think that um, non-religious people uh, don't f- don't feel represented in this country in many ways. So I think it's important. I agree with that completely. Yeah. And uh, as president, I will be very proud to represent non-religious Americans. God bless. In a in a non-ironic or I guess ironic way. Uh, I'm going to go fast. The freedom dividend. You're giving people one thousand dollars a month. How does this play into what a lot of your fellow candidates are talking about with universal health care for a university? By giving people a thousand dollar a month, is the idea to empower them to make those financial decisions, or do you also believe that health care and university should be free in addition to the thousand dollars a month? Health care should not be breaking our backs in the way it is. My goal is not to give you a thousand bucks a month so you can give it to the drug companies or whatnot. Like we we have, we have to get our healthcare costs under control, and the best way to do that is to make um, 
a plan available that's very inexpensive. Uh, healthcare should be a human right, not a means for these giant companies to make tons of money off of us. That's different than universities and education because everyone needs health care. Mm. Frankly, only 33% of Americans graduate from college, and that number is relatively stable. Uh, and so if you decide to make college free, you're subsidizing something that's going to be enjoyed by the top third of your people. And just because you've made that education free doesn't mean that uh, a higher percentage of college graduates are going to be employed in the kind of jobs that they want mm. to be. I mean, they, like the unemployment rate is uh, 40 to 44 percent right now, and that doesn't miraculously change if I bring the cost down. So we're better off putting money into people's hands so that if they go to college, it's partially paid for. If they go to trade school, it's probably almost entirely paid for. If they decide to start a business, they would need to take care of a loved one. We need to treat different paths equally. This is something I'm a little bit troubled by, the democratic recipe, uh, is that the democratic recipe assumes that everyone's going to go to college and that college will solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, neither of those things seems to be true <laughs> by, by mm -hmm. the numbers. Uh, again, the percentage of, of Americans that graduate from college has been essentially stable over the last number of years. And unfortunately, the rate of Americans who attend college and don't finish has been rising. Like you have a 41% chance of not finishing college within mm. six years if you start now. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's really high, you know, yeah. like that, what, what that suggests is that we're putting people into college that it's not a fit for. They don't want to be there. They don't want to be there. Uh, and I mean, right now, sometimes they're just like, oh, it's too much money or, you know, I have other responsibilities. Uh, so we need to have a more personal, uh, a personalized solution that doesn't say college 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 to everybody so if we're not paying for everybody's university do you think that there's something uh, some sort of regulation to do about the cost oh yeah so that said we need to get the cost of college under control mm -hmm. and what i'm proposing is that i looked at the numbers college has gotten two and a half times more expensive not because of professors not even because of facilities it's because of administrators the percentage of administrators to students has gone up 150%. Why? Uh, I think I know why. I think everyone watching this knows why. But if you're a university, uh, you're becoming more and more bureaucratic and complex and you just end up hiring more and more non-academic administrators over time. Mm. And then you look up and being like, well, of course I need these 20 vice deans because, you know, they're all very busy and they're all very nice people. <laughs> and, then, and then your costs just creep up. <laughs> Um, each year because of that because no one ever forces you to bring your cost down and then examine whether you, you need all of these administrators so as president Are you suggesting like that there's some level of corruption in these institutions i would say that they have incentives that all cut the same way and uh, so the, here's the the reality like i ran a nonprofit for mm -hmm. seven years and when you're a nonprofit, you grow and then when you grow you say hey like i need to hire more people and then that person is there. That job is there. It always exists. And that's what happens year after year. So your costs creep up. And if you're a university, you then pass those costs along to families. And then the families look up and say, well, I can't afford this. But then the government says, it's okay. I've got your back. Here's a giant ass loan. Mm. And so now we're up to $1.6 trillion in school loans. The universities don't have any incentive to rein in their costs. <laughs> and families feel like they have no choice but to pay. Mm. So what you have to do is you have to go to the universities and say, look, you have to get your costs down and we're going to put a, a, an administrator to student ratio that's in line with what you were 15, 20 years ago as like a goal. Mm. And if you hit that goal, then great. And if you don't hit that goal, then some, some of the government uh, benefits that you enjoy are going to get scaled back mm. in various ways. Mm -hmm. And the universities will, would hate this, but then you look up and say, well, figure it out. And the fact is, the student experience would not be adversely affected if you were to get rid of half a dozen of the these like vice deans that no one knows what they do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just right now what's happening in our universities is a microcosm of what's happening in a lot of our country where you have these bureaucracies that just grow and grow and then choke off uh, the underlying activity. I mean, that's happening in the healthcare industry. It's happening in our schools. Uh, and these industries then become like a hidden tax hmm. on all of us. So that's, that's the move I would make 
if you talk to people who are on the academic track, the people who got PhDs and want to teach or whatnot, none of them have any tenure track positions anymore. They're all getting pushed into these postdoc purgatories forever yeah. where they get paid it's, subsistence uh, wages. Right. So Less than not subsistence them, they're in a lot not of getting, cases. Get, they're not getting rich. Right. Right. The so, educators aren't getting rich. No. What they're doing is they've essentially constrained the number of educators. Uh, and then they've said, hey, what's that? You're some uh, uh, underpaid PhD. We're just going to exploit you year after year. Mm-hmm. You're going to be in this non-tenure track loop. Um, and then from our perspective, if you're in front of the students, it's all good. <laughs> and, and then the administrator ranks keep growing. seems to me there's an epidemic in this country of things that are for profit that shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Jails, healthcare, university, all well, these kinds of things. The I tricky think thing are... is that the universities are like technically nonprofits, but if you're a nonprofit, you can still just keep on. Someone's making a profit. Well, like the, someone's getting money. You know? I mean, there's there are university presidents and administrators that are getting paid millions of dollars. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that is mm-hmm. the case. <laughs> but <laughs> technically, they're nonprofits, <laughs> you know. And and that so, but your your statement's 100 percent correct. It's like there are a lot of things in this country where people are making a ton of money, um, like the prisons, like the healthcare, and everything else. Well, it's time to wrap it up. No, <laughs> and they're uh, getting messages backstage. They're yelling at me. They're saying, "Wrap it up." <laughs> Yang is a busy man. He has things to do. Well, Yang is a very <laughs> grateful man. Uh, I'm just uh, grateful to be here with you all again. I wish all my campaigning was this fun and joyous <laughs> and interesting, where we just have an intelligent conversation. Well, thank you about thank the problems you. of the day. Uh, and if you're listening to this, we have to solve the problems for you all, the people who are going to inherit this country. I understand if you think politics is a total disaster mess um, because it's depressing and it it makes you think about the scope of the problems that are coming down on the next generation. I think it's criminal what we've done to you all. We've left you this disaster. I want to clean it up in the worst way, but I need your help to clean it up. I need to clean it up for my kids, for Ethan and Hila's kids, for, uh, for anyone who's going to inherit this planet uh, so that we can look you in the eyes and say, we did our best to leave you something we're proud of. Go to Yang 2020. Make a donation. Let's get Yang back on the stage in January. I I love seeing you. I loved having you back. I'm a big fan. I'm Yang Gang yeah. all the way, as you can tell. 1K a month. God bless. Um, thank L- you so much for, for coming back. Yeah, thank let's, you let's for making the time. Let's get that freedom dividend. Thank <laughs> and, yeah. you all so much. So, um, good luck. And, um, uh... What, what more is there to say? Yang2020.com. That's just the next debate. We're waiting. Yeah. 5%. <laughs> hey, the next debate, I guess, not going to be. It's going to be in Iowa. So, uh, I'm not gonna say, <laughs> come on back. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I, 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 <laughs> we got to keep checking in. You know, I love it. But yeah, tell, tell you what. That, um, uh, I'll, I'll will you pledge that I, will, I can be a running mate? I will pledge that we will do a special H3 podcast from the White House. That would be something. That you hear that, Pooper amazing. Troopers? Yeah, that would yeah be amazing. let's do that. And you can you can uh, bring so the, no uh, vice president though. Yeah, uh, you know we have to vet you, Ethan. I don't okay, know. yeah, I don't you know can what vet me. <laughs> 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 um, all right, guys. We'll have a. This is our last episode of the year. Yeah, we are going to be taking a about a month break. Uh, we'll be back in January. For season three of the H3 podcast, guys, have a great uh, Christmas, holidays, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. Apparent, I don't know anything about Kwanzaa, but they throw that in there. So happy Kwanzaa if that's what you do. Festivus. Festivus. Mayor, fe- you a Seinfeld fan? Oh, yeah. Festivus. Yeah. Festivus <laughs> for the rest of us. Yes. You want to wrestle me? <laughs> Out in the... The trial, uh, what did they call it? The trial of uh, feats or the. I don't remember. Feats, right? right, the feats of strength. Yeah, exactly. Let's have a feats of strength off camera, of course. Yeah. You'll take me. You're pretty tall. Well, thank you for noticing. Yeah, you're, you're quite tall. You have good posture, too, but I have a low center of gravity, so we'll see. We'll have a good match. Um, guys, thank you so much. Thank this you. This has been the H3 Podcast, year. the most potent political show of uh, our probably ever. Every existed. So, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Have a great happy break. Happy holidays. Hug your families. Yeah. Hug your families. See you guys in 2020. Gang2020.com. Thanks, everybody, <laughs> for watching.